beginning in verse 1, 2 Thessalonians 2, the first verse. Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one in any way deceive you for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed and the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself to be God. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? Let's pray. Lord, as we talk about prophetic things, as we talk about future things, Lord, we know that there are things that we need to learn about them that will help us to live for you today. And I pray that you would take away the distraction, take away the fears that we walked into the room with about things that are happening or not happening, the things that are going to happen this week. Just give us peace, Lord. We want to be in your presence. We're your sheep, and you are present, and your rod and your staff, they comfort us, Lord. We don't have to be afraid. Even in the presence of the enemy, we're going to be fed. So bless and teach, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. And before I get into the scriptures, can I just say something to us? Uh, it's, not, it's not part of my teaching, it's just on my heart. You know, um, we often, uh, I think every week we welcome visitors, and you guys do a good job of welcoming them. But may I say how grateful I am for those of you who are not our visitors today. Um, I do not take it for granted that you're here. And can I tell you something? I want you to know my heart for you. I want you to be here, you know that. But I want you to do more than be here. I want you to belong here and know that you belong here. You see, the Bible teaches us we are members of the body of Christ. And it's important that you feel like this is where I belong. This is my church, this is his church, and, and I'm part of the body, part, part of the bride. And I hope and pray, if that's not your experience, it becomes your experience. I wanna know you myself. It would just take a little while if we tried to do all that in one day. But my goal and my prayer is that I get to know every one of you better and that our pastoral staff does that. But thank you for coming today. I appreciate it. Welcome back to Calvary Chapel. Well, in our Bibles, we're going to study a little bit about this church. Remember, if you haven't been with us, a little background. Paul plants the church. It's in the book of Acts. And uh, the Gentiles start believing. The Jews start persecuting, which was normal. That's how it went. <coughs> And within three weeks, he has to leave because the persecution is so bad in Thessalonica. And so he isn't sure really, did the, did the church really take? Are they really walking with the Lord? Because we know persecution can cause people to fall away. Probably some of you in this room have witnessed to somebody, seen someone pray a prayer, go forward and walk with the Lord, or at least it appeared to for a while, and then things happened. I remember I led, the first guy I led to the Lord, his name was Bud. Yeah, and I led my friend Bud to Christ, and I prayed with him. I was so excited. I never prayed with anybody to receive the Lord. But as soon as he tried to live out his faith on our high school campus, people started making fun of him. And immediately, he decided he didn't want anything to do with Christianity. Bud was a bro, no mo. <laughs> and he just walked away from the Lord. And, and the Bible says that. So Paul's concerned. These people have received Christ there in Thessalonica. I preached the gospel, but are they really saved? And so he writes, first Thessalonians to them uh, to find out really and to encourage them not to find out but he's already been told they're doing well in their faith so he writes first Thessalonians to encourage and commend them about their faith and also to encourage them how to walk with the Lord in practical purity he writes second Thessalonians because of a concern that has come up since he wrote first Thessalonians concerning false doctrine and false teaching that he's heard about is spreading in the church. A little different. First Thessalonians to commend them and to tell them really about the rapture. Second Thessalonians to correct some problems and actually to focus on the second coming of Christ. So it's important you know those distinctions. 
Now, I don't know about you, I, I, a lot of us um, have been brought up with prophecy, Hal Lindsey and Chuck Smith and, and on and on and on. And I hope many of you are subscribed to Amir's blog, Behold Israel. How many of you are already subscribed to that? Free, I encourage you to do so. He gives nearly daily, but uh, at least once a week, some kind of an update on what's going on in the world. And I think as Christians, we need to know what's happening in the world with regard to prophecy. I highly encourage you to be aware, more aware of studying these things and so that you're not uh, uninformed. But may I say something to you of, that's really important as you learn about and get excited about the last days. The purpose of Bible prophecy is not to kind of make our calendars. The purpose of Bible prophecy is to build our character. You see, it's easy to get very excited about last time's things, but not have it really affect us at all as far as the way we live day to day. Do you remember in Acts chapter 1 when Jesus, risen from the dead, was talking to his disciples about the kingdom? Remember, before he went to heaven, for those 40 days, he's talking to them about the things of the kingdom. And they were sure, well, it's about to happen. You rose from the dead. You fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies. We know you're Messiah. Now the next thing is the kingdom of God. And so they said, is it at this time you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them in Acts 1.8, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the remotest parts of the earth. In other words, it's easy to get focused on the wrong thing, even as we're excited about prophecy, and not realize that Prophetic study should cause us to live differently right now today. So keep that in mind. Put this down, letter A. This is basically the message to those in Thessalonica, and I think to many Christians maybe in this room. Stop, if you are, being shaken and stirred. Put in the words shaken and stirred. Please look at the text again, first two verses. Now we request... You, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, which should excite them, and are gathering together to him, that's the rapture, by the way, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit, a message, or a letter from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. He said, my hands are shaky, my knees are are weak, I can't seem to stand on my own two feet. I'm all shook up. Yeah, that was Elvis Presley. He said he was all shook up because he was in love, but the fact is the church at Thessalonica was all shook up because of a lie, because of their misunderstanding of biblical truth. Can I tell you something? Satan's goal is to prevent you from correctly understanding the Bible. He doesn't really care if you study the Bible, so long as you don't really understand the Bible, because he knows if you don't really understand it, then you can't believe it correctly, and he, his desire is to pervert your understanding of Scripture. Put this down. Don't be confused about God's Word. Don't be confused. You know, um, this was an issue for the Sadducees. In the Gospels. Remember, Jesus' biggest enemies in the Gospels were two groups, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And I think sometimes we just go, yeah, those were the bad guys. Well, they were people that hated each other, by the way. The Sadducees were the liberals of their day, the Pharisees were the conservatives, and the twain didn't meet except in their hatred for Jesus. The Sadducees were, by the way, the ones who ran the temple. The Pharisees did not. They were together in the Sanhedrin, but not in the running of the temple. The Sadducees were liberal, they were rich and they had power with the Romans. But it's the Sadducees, you remember, who did not believe all of the Old Testament. They only accepted the writings of Moses. And because they only believed in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, they said there is no such thing as angels, there is there's no such thing as life after death, because Moses didn't mention it, so we don't believe it. Doesn't matter who else talks about, like Daniel talks about resurrection, we don't believe in that. So it's interesting, when Jesus is talking to the Sadducees, what he says, he says, you do err because you do not know the scriptures. That was a little slap in the face because they would have claimed they knew them. You know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. And by the way, Jesus took time to prove life after death to them from the first five books of the Bible. 
Remember, they only believe in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So he takes them to Exodus 3, one of the ones that they accepted when God introduced himself to Moses at the burning bush. And he said to Moses, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not I was, they're long dead. But I still am right now. And Jesus says he's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. They're still alive. When God, and he proves it to them from their own Bible. They don't receive it, of course. But the Sadducees did not understand or believe all of the scriptures. I think of the two men, purportedly re, really disciples of Jesus, followers of Jesus, up until the time he was crucified, who although he's risen from the dead, don't know he's alive from the dead. Remember, it's recorded in Luke 24, they're on the road to Emmaus. And they're bummed out. Remember, you know the story. Jesus comes up, they don't recognize him, he's walking with them. And remember what Jesus said to them? You slow of heart to believe, listen to me, all that the prophets have written about the Messiah. In other words, you only believe the part that the Messiah is going to come and cause Israel to be the head and not the tail, to establish his kingdom. You, you, you read that part, but you ignore the other part about how the Messiah had to die and suffer in order to enter into his kingdom. In other words, you don't read Isaiah 53. You don't read Daniel 9 where it says Messiah will be cut off. They're right there in your Bible but you were ignoring part of your Bible. And as a result, you're not even aware of what God is doing right now. You know, the fact is, the Jews, even the religious Jews, believed that Messiah was coming, but what they did not detect in the prophecies was that there were two comings, a first and a second. Can I tell you, there are a lot of Christians today who I believe when it comes to the rapture and the second coming are doing the exact same thing. They only think there's one coming, and the rapture is part of the second coming. They are missing what the Bible clearly teaches. You know, the devil is not afraid to use the Bible. Can I say from the very beginning, we see that. By the way, did you know that Jesus was tempted by the devil with the Bible? Yeah, Satan quotes the psalm, Psalm 91, for him to throw himself down from the pinnacle of the temple, saying, hey, it says right in the Bible that... He, God, will give his angels charge concerning you lest you dash your foot against a stone. Go ahead and throw yourself. He tries to tempt the Bible with the author. That's crazy. Jesus wrote it. Didn't work. But oh, he's not afraid to use the Bible on you. By the way, how did he tempt Eve? With the word of God, just slightly twisted. Hath God not said? That's how Satan began his temptation. But Satan will always put a question mark where God will put a period when it comes to his word. So Satan wants to mess with us in terms of our understanding. Why? Because, you see, he knows that if he can rob you of your understanding and faith in the actual word of God, he can take away your confidence and your peace. Exactly what happened here. There was fear and confusion. Can I tell you something? It is possible, and I've seen a lot of it done, it's possible to prove just about anything from the Bible. You can prove just about anything you want to from the Bible, and many have. Like that couple, you know, the man said, I am the only one who makes coffee in this family. It's biblical. He brews, you know. <laughs> and you laugh, but that, I've heard far worse things tried to be proved. Some of you wives are going, that works for me, honey, it's your job. Any text taken out of context can be used as a pretext for error. That's why... Our Wednesday night program is called Awana, a workman who doesn't need to be ashamed. Paul wrote to a young pastor, Timothy, with these words. Study, that's King James, it doesn't actually mean to study like you do when you're doing homework. Be diligent is the better translation. To prove yourself a workman who doesn't need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. In other words, be a person who knows your Bible well enough and accurately enough to apply it and interpret it correctly. Otherwise, you're going to wind up in error. Jot down John 21, verses 22 and 23. This is after Jesus has risen from the dead. It's, it's the last chapter of John, and he's recording what Jesus said to Peter and about himself in a prophecy that Jesus gave. Uh, remember, uh, just the background of this, Jesus told Peter, when you were young, you used to clothe yourself and go wherever you wanted to. But when you're old, it won't be that way. Other people will gird you and they'll take you where you don't want to go. And John says right in the text, this was about how Peter was going to glorify the Lord and die. Peter died as a martyr under Nero. John writes his gospel later. Looking back, he is now writing that Jesus was prophesying that Peter 
would die a martyr's death. But he also recorded this. So Peter, seeing John, said to Jesus, Lord, and what about this man? You're telling me about my future. What about John? And Jesus said to him, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Please notice, therefore, this saying went out among the brethren that that disciple, John, would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but only if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? It, it, listen, even the true word of God, what Jesus said, was misinterpreted orally by people who didn't understand what he meant, even during the gospel times. Jot down 2 Peter 3 and verse 16. Peter talking about the last days and the patience of the Lord, how he's not willing that any would perish, but that all would come to repentance. He says, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, wrote to you, as also in all of his letters, speaking in them of these things, the return of Christ, in which are some things hard to understand, Peter says, which the untaught and the unstable distort. The word distort in Greek means to twist. It's actually used of the word to torture. They twist as they do the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction. Very interesting, by the way. It's fascinating for a number of reasons. One, it's a place where Peter calls Paul's writing scripture. The inspiration of scripture is kind of interestingly mentioned and supported by Peter, even in his writings about Paul right there, when he calls the rest of scripture. But in any case, you see the point. The untaught, the unstable distort the scriptures always to our own destruction. Put this down. Know that your tribulation, because you're going through your own, know that your tribulation isn't the tribulation. And that was the problem here. Verse 2, he says that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter. What? That the day of the Lord has come. So the Christians in Thessalonica are going through heavy persecution, and somehow they had begun to think, hey, we are in the midst of the great tribulation. And Paul says, not so. Jot down Luke 21, verses 7 through 9. Talking about Christ's teaching concerning the last days, they questioned Jesus and said, teacher, when therefore will these things happen? And what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? He said, see to it that you're not misled, for many will come in my name saying, I am he, and the time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and disturbances, do not be terrified, for these things must take place first, but the end does not follow immediately. Let me just paraphrase what Jesus said. Don't be fooled and don't be frightened. Do you know that the two big guns the devil has in your life as a Christian are fear and falsehoods. Remember what Jesus said in John 8? He is the father of lies. He is really, really good at lying. The Bible says God has not given us a spirit of fear. So what that means is this. If you've got one, you better consider the source. Let me say that again. God has not given us a spirit of fear. So if you've got a spirit of fear, it's not from the Lord and we know who it's come from. You know, in James, James talks about wisdom from God. But he says that's not the only source of wisdom. He says there's a wisdom that's from above and there's a wisdom that's from below. You might say there's wise and there's otherwise. <laughs> the wisdom from above is peaceable brings peace, yielding. It's the fruit of the Spirit. But the peace that's from below is earthly, natural, and demonic, and it brings confusion and strife and every evil thing. Well, this church is struggling with fear that they're in the middle or starting into the great tribulation, and as a result of that, they are terrified. So again, spirit of fear, I consider the source, but also we should consider and comprehend the solutions. How do you overcome fear? In the Bible, fear is overcome by the person of God, the presence of God, and the precepts of God. You say, what do you mean by that? The person of God. He will keep thee in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, Isaiah writes. The presence of God, what did David say? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil for. He's with me. I'm in his presence, you see. 
And then the precepts, the law, the word of God, great peace have they which love thy law and nothing will offend them, the psalmist said. So Paul says, whether by a spirit you've come to this conclusion, what does he mean? That would have been a false prophecy that was given in one of the meetings. Or a word, which would have been a false teaching by somebody that got up to teach. Or even a letter purportedly as being from us. This would have been a forged letter. And so it's possible somebody actually wrote a letter, claimed that it was from Paul or his missionary team, and they were reading it. Or somebody said, I heard them say, you know, that we're in the great tribulation, the day of the Lord has come. Some of you have gotten a call from the IRS. <laughs> Some of you are wondering why other people are laughing. <laughs> well, I have good news for you. They're not going to call you. So if they're calling you, you can just hang up on them or witness to them. They'll, they'll hang up on you. But the fact is, it's kind of like that. Paul's saying, if you're getting a word from someone, it's not us. I don't, that's not what we are teaching, that you're in the great tribulation, that the day of the Lord has come. Uh-uh. That's why at the end of this book, he'll say, see with what large letters I'm writing. I'm written with my own hand. Paul is saying, I'm going to authenticate my message to you. I would never have written to you something different than what I've told you about Christ's return. Now, it's an interesting thing. The Bible tells us that after Paul was basically kicked out of Thessalonica because of the persecution, his next stop was Berea. Paul went from Thessalonica to Berea sharing the gospel, then to Athens, and then finally to Corinth. And it's in Corinth that he's writing these letters. But what a difference the response of the Jews, uh, the, the, the response of the Jews was very different in Thessalonica than it was in Berea. Quite normally, what happened in Thessalonica happened everywhere else. The Jews revolted against Paul as he went to the synagogue and he preached that Jesus was the Messiah. And there was a riot, usually a riot and a revival. That's usually what happened. But while the Jews in Thessalonica hated Paul, wanted to kill him, the Jews actually in the synagogue in Berea did not. When they heard Paul preach that Jesus is our Messiah and he would show them that from their Old Testament scriptures, the Jewish people actually went home and they opened their Bibles. The Bible says they examined everything that Paul said. They scrutinized it by the scriptures to see if the things he was saying were true. And so there was a great response. That's why the Bible says that the Jews... Not the Gentiles, but the Jews in Berea were more noble than the Thessalonians because they examined the things that he had said. We are told to examine everything. By the way, this is what Paul did say to the church at Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians 5. Examine everything, hold fast to that which is true. Here's the truth for us. We need as Christians to test everything we hear against everything God has said. Test everything you hear from this pulpit or from a book or on the radio against what God has said. Some of you remember uh, phone directories. They're now in the Smithsonian, I think. But anyway, back in the day. You remember they would drop them off on your driveway and go, oh, great, I already got eight of those in my pantry or whatever. Do you might not remember this, but there was another company who decided back when people cared about phone directories, I guess, and uh, you know, other than putting your toddler on it so they're a little taller at the table. Uh, well, at least that's what some of us did in the room. Um, do you remember the Donnelly directory? You might not, but the Donnelly directory was trying to compete with the regular big yellow pages, and, and I remember their tagline of their advertisement. They said, our book is the book that the other guys don't want you to read. And I thought, you know, that's, that's exactly right. This is the book that the other guys don't want you to read. Satan does not want you to know or believe your Bible or to correctly understand your Bible because if you do, he's in trouble. The Bible is our measuring tape for truth. Jot it down, Matthew 13 and verse 52. Jesus said, therefore, every scribe who has become a disciple of the kingdom is like a head of a household who brings out of his treasure things new and things old. The Bible is our treasure chest. There is a truth for every trial you'll ever go through. There's a word for every worry in your life. And there is a promise for every problem. Do you know there are over 7,000 promises in the Bible? That's about 19 a day for a year. And I guarantee you, whatever you're facing right now, there's a promise of God, there's a principle of God that applies to your life. But you can never be relieved by what 
is yet to be believed. If you don't know it, if you don't understand it, then you can't put your faith down on it. Put this down, letter B. Know why the day of the Lord has not dawned yet. Why? Put in the words why and dawn. Look at verse 3. Let no one in any way deceive you. It, referring to the day of the Lord, will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed the son of destruction. Now, the term day of the Lord is a very involved term. It's not about one day. The day of judgment when God judges, it's not a particular day. It's a period of time. You can read about it all through the Old Testament. The Old Testament prophets spoke much of it. Read Joel 2, for instance. But it's a day, the Bible says, of darkness and of gloom when God is pouring out his wrath on a world that has rejected him. It is the time we refer to as the Great Tribulation. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble. And there's a number of reasons God has predicted it's going to come. And Jesus spoke much about it, and so does the Apostle Paul. What was happening was these Christians were feeling that they were going through the great tribulation. But the scriptures teach that's not possible. You see, the day of the Lord, it's interesting when you think about it. If you think about it from a Jewish standpoint, what time of day does a new day begin for a Jew? Sunset. It was evening. And morning and one day, the Bible says. Their days begin in the evening, unlike our days, which begin at 12 a.m. or when the sun comes up. You gotta understand, the day of the Lord begins with darkness. <laughs> Absolutely, it gets darker and darker and darker, but ultimately the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in his wings, you see. That's a reference to the coming millennial reign of Christ. The day of the Lord actually is not just the time of. God's judgment, but it extends even to the time when Christ will reign on the earth. All of it is considered part of the day of the Lord. There are two things that Paul says have not happened yet. So we can't be in the day of the Lord, and he mentions two. We'll study a third one next week, by the way. But put this down. First of all, the departure hasn't arrived yet. The departure hasn't arrived. There in verse 3, he says, it will not come, the day of the Lord, unless the apostasy comes first. Now, the first seven English translations of the Bible, Tyndale, Coverdale, um, Wycliffe, these first English translations all translated this word that's translated apostasy, they all translated it with the word departure. Because this Greek word apostasia, where we get our word apostasy, which in our minds is colored with one thing, people falling away from the faith. That is a legitimate interpretation and translation of the word, but it didn't only mean that it, from the Greek. It had other meanings, and one of them was a departure. So it is a departure, either from the faith, a departure from the faith that's going to come, Paul says that hasn't happened yet, or a departure from a place. May I say to you, both of those are true. We can't be in the day of the Lord yet because the departure, and he doesn't tell us exactly which one he's referring to, but may I suggest to you both are true. In fact, I believe they're tied to each other. The departure of the church from this world is what's going to precipitate the final departure into apostasy of the church. If you read in Revelation, you will find the chaste bride of Christ, the church is not there, but you will find the harlot there, which represents Revelation 17, mystery Babylon and the false religion that will be all over this world. So it's very interesting. But we do know there is a departure coming from the faith. Jot down 1 Timothy 4 and verse 1. The Spirit explicitly says that in the later times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. And Jesus mentions this too with regard in the end times. Jot it down, Matthew 24, verses 10 and 11, referring to the end. At that time, many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. So we do know that there is going to be a falling away from the faith. Now here's the issue. There has always been from the very beginning, people that have fallen away from the faith. They went out from us because they were never really of us, John writes, right? So the wheat and the tares have always been in the church and there have been apostatizing, Judas apostatizing. So that's nothing new. 
This has the definite article. It's not general apostatizing. It is the apostasy, the falling away. So some argue that it must be an event rather than just more of the same. But in any case, we believe it is both the departure of the church physically from the earth. See, from the viewpoint of earth, the removal of believers is a departure. From the viewpoint of heaven, it's the rapture. So put this down, number two. Also, the Antichrist has not been revealed. Can't be the day of the Lord, Paul says. Why? Well, look at the text, second half of verse three. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. He hasn't been revealed, so it can't be the day of the Lord. Now, you know, there are over 30 titles for this person in the Bible, Old and New Testament. He's called the prince that will come. He is called the little horn. He has all kinds of titles. Uh, like I said, about 30. But the one that's stuck for the church are the five times that John uses the term antichrist. When I say antichrist, some of you picture Nikolai Carpathia. Yeah, Nikolai's not in the Bible anywhere, just so you know. But there is this one who is uniquely going to be empowered by Satan. He's an imitation Messiah, kind of it's an imitation incarnation is what it is. But here's something that you think about, yeah, I don't know much about the Antichrist. It's kind of scary. I've read the books. I watched the movie. Um, you need to know more about Antichrist than he is some person that will be coming in the Great Tribulation. Jot down 1 John 4 and verse 3. John says, every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard it is coming, future, and now it is already in the world. Very interesting. There is a person, a man coming, who will be the incarnation of evil, you might say, the false Messiah, the false Christ that Satan will empower. You see, Satan's an imitator. Absolutely. Just as we are waiting for Jesus Christ to come, he is going to produce his own Christ. But just as even though Christ is not yet here returning, his spirit, the spirit of Christ is in the world, so too this Antichrist, before he comes, the spirit of Antichrist is in the world. And that's something worth thinking about. Why? What is the spirit of Antichrist? Well, we're told the nature of Antichrist in the text. He opposes every form of God, so he's godless or anti-God, but he also will seek to be worshipped as God or display himself as God in the temple. Now that's fascinating if you think about it. You see, the word anti can mean against or it can also mean a replacement. He is the one who comes against Christ and everything Christ stands for, but he also seeks to be the replacement Messiah, in fact, will be believed in by the Jews for a season. Did you know that? Daniel says he'll enter into a covenant with the Jews. And so when you think about it, here's a principle for us. Satan really doesn't care if you believe in God or not. He doesn't really care if you're an atheist or an evangelist, so long as you aren't worshiping the true and living God. See, Jesus said to the Pharisees, you're very evangelistic. You go about on land and sea to make one convert. And when you make a convert, you make them twice the son of hell that you are. It doesn't matter if you're missing church because you don't believe in God or because you're out surfing or you've made soccer your God or, you know, sleeping in. It really doesn't matter. Or if you're here serving your brains out, but you're full of self-righteousness. What did Jesus say to Martha? Martha, you're worried about the wrong things. Your, your sister's down at my feet worshiping, you see. And Satan's very subtle. He just wants to get you from worshiping the true and living God, whether you reject him or you just don't allow him to be everything that he wants to be in your life. The Bible says, God says, you will have no other gods before me and no other gods beside me. Well, do you know something? The rabbis today, in our day, right now, in Israel, the Orthodox rabbis teach the Messiah will be recognized First of all, when you think, when they talk about Messiah, they're not talking about a supernatural being like we believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God at all. The Messiah is just a man. And the Jewish rabbis say, we will recognize our Messiah because he will be the man that will help us build our temple. Now that's amazing. Talk about a setup because we know scripturally speaking that the Antichrist will come and make a covenant with them. 
know, there's no temple right now in Jerusalem, but there will be one by the time of the middle of the tribulation because the Antichrist will display himself as God and demand to be worshipped. Jot down John 5 and verse 43, a very interesting prophecy Jesus gave concerning the Antichrist. He said, I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. But if another comes in his own name, you will receive him. You might say that the Antichrist is going to teach replacement theology. <laughs> He's replacing God with himself and telling people to worship him. Now, in the Great Tribulation, which, by the way, begins in Revelation chapter 6... Uh, you know, uh, if you're interested in these things like, how do we know it's pre-trib versus post-trib or mid-trib or, you know, whatever? Can I tell you, I am so pre-trib, I don't even eat post-toasties anymore. <laughs> and if you're wondering why, like, you know, there are some people like, I don't care, just whatever, it'll all pan out in the end. Well, you know, I think there's truth about the timing that is very important to the way we live our lives. And it'll affect us. If you think you're in the tribulation right now because you don't understand you're going to be gone before these things happen. You're going to live like the Thessalonians did in a lot of trial. Because think about it. The Bible says the Proverbs 31 woman smiles at the future. These folks think they're in the Great Tribulation and it's just starting. It's like, well, it's just going to get worse. You're not smiling at your future. If you think you're going to go through the Tribulation, you know what you think? I'm probably going to die a horrible death. Well, praise God for that, you know. And here's what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians. God has not destined us for wrath but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. But if you don't have the hope of the, not just the resurrection, but the hope of the rapture, the Bible calls the rapture our blessed hope. How is that a blessed hope if, yeah, it's going to be, you're going to be dead. You're going to be one of those dead bodies he's raising, because that makes no sense at all. By the way, another thing that's very interesting to me, as you read Revelation, there's no greater description of the Great Tribulation than the book of Revelation. You will find that the word church is not mentioned once in Revelation 6 through Revelation 19, during the time when all the wrath of God is poured out. It's mentioned seven times in Revelation 2 and 3. Those were the letters to the existing churches of Asia Minor that were in existence in the first century. Jesus sends letters to the churches, and so the word church is used. But as soon as you get to chapter 4, something completely changes, and it's pretty remarkable and pretty radical. If you've never studied the book of Revelation, in chapter 4, John sees a door open in heaven, and he hears the voice of a trumpet, the voice that he had heard in Revelation 1, who we know, you go read it, it's Jesus Christ. It's no question about it. And it's saying, come up here. And suddenly he was in the spirit and he's in heaven. And he sees all the things that are happening during the tribulation from heaven's vantage point. It's like this miniature rapture. John is suddenly in heaven. The saints are worshiping. It's me and you, you guys. We're there. We're worshiping the one who has redeemed mankind from every tribe and every tongue. We're there. We're not here. But if you don't know that, if you don't believe that, like the church of Thessalonica, you're going to have all kinds of concerns. And your tribulation, you're going to think, maybe is the great tribulation. But Revelation 6 begins with what's called the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Maybe you know those. The first one that John sees when that first seal is opened on the scroll, remember? is a white horse. You say, oh, somebody riding a white horse, it's got to be Jesus. Well, keep reading. No, no, the white horse Jesus is on is Revelation 19. Different, different, different guy. No, this is the beginning of the tribulation. This is the beginning of God's wrath. But it begins very interesting with a, what appears to be a good guy on a white horse. And he goes forth conquering and to conquer. He has a bow, but no arrows are mentioned. And he accomplishes evidently peace in the world. For a season. But read the second, third, and fourth horses, and you'll find that the second horseman is war, and the third is pestilence and disease, and the fourth is death from pestilence and from war, from the sword. 25% of the world's population is killed. Do you know how many people that is, you guys? That is beyond our, almost our imagination. That's just starting out in the book of Revelation as the seals begin. Jesus said this world has never undergone anything like this before. We've never seen it before. There have been people who thought they were in the Great Tribulation. There were people preaching in Great Britain during World War II. They were convinced Hitler was the Antichrist, and they were going through the Great Tribulation during the Blitz. But it wasn't. It's going to be far worse than that. Oh, no, the fact is we need to know the timing of what God is doing. But the Antichrist, Paul says it can't be the day of the Lord because the Antichrist has not been 
revealed. And the Bible teaches us some more things about this one who's coming. He's called the son of lawlessness, the son of perdition. For instance, we are told elsewhere that he's going to bring peace to the world, even peace in the Middle East. He is the one who will be behind a one world government. He will restore the ancient Roman Empire that hasn't really existed for almost 2,000 years. He will put it back together. That will be his his main place that he comes out of, one world government, a cashless society that's universal in his economic system, and a universal religion. I mean, put all that together and think about it. I mean, can you even imagine? Can you imagine there are no countries? It isn't hard to do. (laughs) Nothing to kill or die for, and no religion, too. Imagine all the people living life in peace. You hoo hoo. (laughs) You may say I'm a dreamer, I'm not the only one. See, this idea of of, uh, coexist and come together and sing kumbaya and hands across the world, nothing new. The world's been waiting for it, looking for it, and is ready for it. But the fact is, the nation of Israel will accept that Messiah who will help them build their temple, who will bring peace to the Middle East, but he is going to be the false Messiah. Now, people have always wanted to know, forever, since it was written here, who is the Antichrist? Do you know the preface to the King James Bible when it came out in 1611 actually declared the Antichrist is the Pope? Actually says it. You can go read it. It's what they said. Pope of the Catholic Church is the Antichrist. Uh, Of course, people thought it was Hitler. Maybe if you were alive and living in that time and knowing your Bible, you would have thought that too. Stalin, Kissinger, I remember when Henry, everybody thought he was, Khrushchev, Castro, Juan Carlos of Spain, and Saddam, who I say was insane, but uh, uh, have all been accused, and many, 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 countless others have been accused. Well, he's the Antichrist, he's the, I think he's, you know, sometimes I have people come up to me, especially when we do studies like this, and they'll say, hey, what about this guy, you know, Trump's going to go help them build their temple, what do you, you know, what do you think? Uh, or they'll say, do you think so-and-so is the Antichrist? My answer is always the same um, to the question of if I think so-and-so is the Antichrist. It's the same that I give, or it's given in the song, Jimmy Cracked Corn. <laughs> yeah. I don't care, because I don't plan to be here when he is revealed. So if you think you know who he is, you're wrong, because you're still here. Look, I am not going to waste my time trying to figure out who the Antichrist might be when I can spend my time focusing on being whom Jesus Christ has called me to be. Isn't that why we're here? That's the point. We need to understand these things so it changes the way we live now. Look, there are three symptoms. Briefly, you can write them down. There's no outline for you uh, on this, but just three things I want you to keep in mind. Three symptoms that if these things are going on in your life, then something's wrong from our text. First of all, looking at this church, their peace was disturbed. They, they, they had lost their peace. They, they, they were disturbed. That's verse 2. Secondly, if you want to jot down, their, their minds were deceived. That's verse 3. So your peace is disturbed. Secondly, your mind is deceived. That's a hard one to know many times because you can't tell. But the third one is things that you know or have learned of the word of God and truth are being dismissed. That's verse 5. Look at verse 5. Do you not remember that while I was with you, I was telling you these things? Don't miss the point that's being made here. Do you remember when the women came to the tomb to finish the funeral? They saw an angel. The door is open. Remember? Soldiers are shaking like dead men. It's an amazing day. We love that day. And then the angel says, why are you seeking the living one among the dead? You know the story. He's not here. He is risen. But don't miss the next words. Just as he said. Now, please don't miss the dig. He didn't have to say it. He's risen. Who? Just go celebrate. But I want to remind you, you should know. He told you that. In Luke 24, it specifically says, the angel actually says, Remember what he was talking to you about up in Galilee? He refers to a particular place and time. Remember when Jesus was saying this? He, it should have been obvious. Look, before I was a full-time pastor, I was a full-time police officer, I was a detective. One of my jobs was to hire recruits to become police officers for the city of Placentia. 
And you, some of you know about this because of your corporate background or you've just heard the phrase. There's a phrase, you know or you should have known. You know this or you should have known. For instance, in my line of work as a cop, it was very important that if somebody had some problems in their background, say they lost their temper and they punched somebody out, a neighbor at work or whatever, and then as a police officer, I hire them to be a police officer and give them a badge and a gun, if after I hire them, they go and punch somebody out or shoot somebody, excessive force, guess what? Me and our city has a huge problem of extra liability. Why? Because we knew or should have known this person had a propensity of violence. It's not just in law enforcement. It's used all over the place with liability. You knew or you should have known. Do you remember what Jesus said as he's coming into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday? We call it Palm Sunday. They didn't. On Palm Sunday. And he wept over Jerusalem and he said this. If you had only known the things that make for peace especially in this thy day, but now they are hidden from your eyes. What the, what's he talking about? He's talking about a prophecy in Daniel 9. This was the day that Messiah was to be presented. And in essence, he's saying, you knew or you should have known. When, here's what Paul is saying. I talked to you about these things. This should not be a problem. But because you actually have forgotten or don't really understand the word of God, you have problems that you don't need to have. Interesting. We can only be practically relieved by truth we've received and personally believed. So here's our tendency. Our tendency is to quote Bible verses to one another, to comfort each other. Now, it's not completely wrong, but sometimes we make a mistake. I've said it before. Something goes wrong in my life, and my Christian friends want to quote, count it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials thinking that's going to come for me. No, quote it to yourself. I need to believe it for myself, you see. But we, are, we have a tendency of saying, Romans 8, 28, you know, all things are working together for good. It's not that it's not true. The problem is you and I have a much harder time believing it for ourselves. But if we don't know the word of God, we can't believe the word of God. If we know and say we believe the word of God, then we're going to let it affect our lives. Paul says, you have dismissed the things you've learned, and that's why you're having trouble. Put this down. God's word should excite your faith, not ignite your fears. Put in the words faith and fears and jot down Romans 15 and verse 4. We're close. Romans 15 and verse 4. Paul says, whatever was written in earlier times. What's that a reference to? The entire Old Testament. <laughs> for whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance, hanging in there, and, need them both, the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. I read this Peanuts cartoon years ago when Charles Schultz was still alive. I want you to see it. It's raining outside. Lucy says to Linus, Boy, look at it rain. What if the floods, what if it floods the whole world? He says, that'll never happen. In the ninth chapter of Genesis, God promised Noah that would never happen again. And the sign of the promise is a rainbow. She smiles. You've taken a great load off my mind. He says, sound theology has a way of doing that. <laughs> true then, true now. When you know and believe the Bible, you won't have to worry about a lot of things you will worry about if you don't know or believe the Bible. And a lot of us in this room, we know it. But do you believe it? Listen, you only believe that portion of the Bible that you obey and that you're willing to apply to your own life. So the question is, do you believe these things? Finally, we'll close with Luke 21, 28 from the King James Bible. Here's what Jesus said. He said, when these things begin to come to pass, he's talking about end time events, when these things begin to come to pass, remember, it's like birth pangs, Jesus said, like a woman who's going into labor, and you know that, that labor progresses as these things, earthquakes and famines, it's not that we have an earthquake, oh, Jesus is coming back, there have been earthquakes a lot, you know, a famine, no, there have always been famines, or birth pangs, they come closer together and more intense, but he said, when these things begin to come to pass, Look up, lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Listen, the closer we get to Christ's return, no matter how dark this world gets, the closer we get to the rapture, I can just say things are looking up. That doesn't mean that we rejoice in seeing suffering. It means that we are realizing Jesus said it's going to be this way, 
and the word of God gives me assurance, he's taking us home. We're his bride. He said, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. He didn't say that where you are, I will be also. No, he's coming to get us. And if you're a child of God, you don't have to fear. By the way, let me just say one other thing. Sometimes I hear people say, well, what if, what if he doesn't take me? You know? <laughs> well, first of all, if you're, not a, if you're not a Christian, you need to come to Christ. Because if you don't have confidence, he's going to take you. It may be you've never given your life to the Lord. He is not coming for all men. Clearly, he is coming for his church. He is coming for his bride. And if you don't know if you're saved, you need to settle that one. The Bible says, make your calling and your election sure. How can I do that? Come talk to us. Come in the prayer. We'd be happy to help you to know that. But if you say, well, no, I'm a Christian, but I saw the movie, and, you know, the left behind thing, and I'm just you know, afraid that my friends are going to go, and I'm not going to make it. You should not be living with that kind of a fear, first of all. God doesn't intend that for you. But Satan does. I've told you before, Satan's goal is to make saved people think they're not and to cause people that aren't saved to think they are. He's a liar. So you don't have to fear, well, he's going to take, you know, half the congregation from the third row or something, you know, A through K or, you know, somehow I'm, I'm going to be left behind. The Bible is very clear. He is coming back. Here's, here's the group that get to go. Paul put it this way. We who are alive and remain. That's it. It wasn't, we who are alive and remain and had quiet times consistently for the last three weeks. No! We who are alive and remain. I like to tell people this. If I, if I was a general and I was about to have to attack my enemy in a definitive way, let's say I was going to send in bombers with napalm, fighters with napalm, and I knew that my children were behind enemy lines, right where I was going to bomb, and I could get them out before I did. Do you have any question that I'd get them out if I had the power to do so? Listen, when, when uh, the Great Tribulation is God declaring war, basically, on this world, who is already at war with him, and all hell will break loose. Satan will be on the earth, and he knows it, the Bible says in Revelation 12. But I can tell you this. What happens before a nation declares war on another nation, you know what they do? They get their ambassadors out. And that's what you are. You're an ambassador for Jesus Christ. He is going to get you out before he sends in the wrath of God. Let's pray. Father, I pray then that you would help us to put our confidence in the word of God, in the promises of God, that we wouldn't be afraid that we're going to go through some trial beyond what you would want us to. Lord, that doesn't mean we won't suffer. In fact, we know that we will and we ought to. And we would be ready, Lord, to suffer as some do in this world far beyond what we have ever imagined. But Lord, thank you that that is not the great tribulation. Ours feels great because it's ours. But Lord, because you're in charge of everything that happens in our life, you are working together even the hardest of things to bring us closer to you, to make us more like you. Bless you and come for us when you're ready. Make us ready in Jesus' name. Amen.